All right, so who ready for some stories that'll keep you up at night? Huh? You? Anyone? You? Anyone? You? 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 Listen, <laughs> if y'all see me, get up and shoot out of my chair upstairs real quick during the video, man. Y'all just keep throwing... Keep flowing like nothing ever happened. I'm gonna come right back, bro. Is that and that's because I'm still, still trying to, you know, tackle the beast right there, the beast. But uh, welcome back to the channel. Listen, man, the next video is five dark and disturbing real life stories that will keep you up tonight. All right. So if you're new to the channel, man, hit the subscribe button, join the fam, and uh, real quick. Moment of silence for the haters. That's enough. Now run the likes up. Make sure y'all hit that like button. Let's get to it. There is nothing more terrifying than a real life horror story. Something so disturbing that you can't believe it actually happened. While in today's video, we look at five real life cases that shock the communities they affected and made them question how a human being could be so callous to another human being. In this video we look at five dark and disturbing real life stories that are sure to stir emotions in your brain that will keep you up tonight. Now before we begin, if you like us here at Top Fives, you've probably got a knack for documentaries and true crime programming outside of the confines of YouTube. There are so many untold stories out there where and if true crime isn't your first cup of tea, they also withhold documentaries covering subjects such as science There we go. Stories. Attempted murder turned meme. This next one is an ongoing saga of misguided heroism in which a young woman who tries to brutally murder her boyfriend gains a cult following amongst the Japanese meme community. It all began on May 23rd, 2019 when 21-year-old Yuka Takaoka was arrested for brutally stabbing her boyfriend, 20-year-old Phoenix Luna. The gruesome photos that were released in the aftermath showed Yuka sitting in the lobby next to her horribly wounded lover, completely drenched in his blood, casually smoking and talking on her mobile phone to an unknown person. He just said casually talking. Like, she did this and went on with a ca conversation. Like she was holding the phone and just stabbing him at the same time while carrying on a ca casually sitting there. Some crazy people, bro. He trenched in his blood, casually smoking and talking on a mobile phone to an unknown person. The photograph soon went viral, but instead of people being repulsed by the image, the online anime community in Japan sanctified Yuka as the manifestation of a real life Yandere, a character from the world of anime. Such a character, typically female, turns to homicidal violence in the pursuit of love. Since the attack, dozens of Instagram accounts have sprung up in support of Yuka and her besotted supporters claim she is too beautiful to be an attempted murder suspect. A donation page was even set up to support Yuka at raise over $3,000. Yuka and Phoenix both worked in hostess clubs in the Kabukicho district in Shinjuku, Tokyo. Yuka was a manager of a so-called girls bar, and Phoenix was a bar host at Fusion Nightclub. Hostess clubs are famous in the nightlife industry of East Asian countries, where male and female hosts are paid to keep guests company and entertain them. Yuka and Luna had recently started dating, but Yuka had grown increasingly jealous of the female attention her boyfriend received as a host. And when he arrived at her home late on May 23rd, and the couple had an argument about a photo of a woman Phoenix had on his phone. The couple went to bed, but Yuka waited for her boyfriend to fall asleep before viciously slicing open his stomach with a kitchen knife. Damn. Phoenix woke up terrified and managed to escape to the first floor lobby of the apartment block and call emergency services, and that is when the horrific photo was taken. Phoenix was later rushed unconscious to hospital. After the sick image started circulating and Yuka was arrested, media reports emerged stating that Yuka told investigators, Since I loved him so much, I just couldn't help it. I was sad and seeking to die, and I thought about how I would like to go about it. I thought I would like to kill him because I thought that was how I could be with him. I thought that expressions such as, I like you, and I would like to be with you, would become a reality if we both die. 
whoa, whoa, whoa. Bro, do you really know the person you laying next to? Are you comfortable enough to fall asleep? Cause you could wake up with your stomach cut open and her wanting you to die with her so y'all could be together. Are you serious? Are you serious? I ain't never heard nothing like that. Kill us both so we can die and be together. That's different. I don't want that type of love. Uh-uh, uh-uh. I don't, I, don't, I don't want that type of love. Fortunately, Phoenix survived the attack after initially only being given a 20% chance. And he pops up on Twitter on July 1st, 2019, tweeting, Sorry guys, but I survived this one. Despite his trauma, Phoenix Luna showed no ill will towards Yuka and told reporters, I don't hold a grudge. There was a reason for her to stab me. It was also thanks to her that I was able to achieve the sales I did in less than a year since returning as a host. Oh, they made for each other. You hear his response? Oh yeah, they made for each other. Never mind, carry on. Yuka has been charged with the attempted murder of Phoenix Luna and is currently in custody awaiting her court date. Meanwhile, her crime and misplaced admiration lives on in the form of the many memes and artwork created of her crime. The tragic story of the Donner Party. In the 1840s, the fertile farmlands of central California drew a steady stream of settlers. And in the spring of 1846, several families from Springfield, Illinois, joined the westward migration. On April 14th, 1846, after an emotional farewell, wealthy brothers George and Jacob Donner, along with local businessman James Reed and their families, left Springfield to make the long journey to a new life in the Bay of San Francisco. The group consisted of George and Jacob's combined 12 children, as well as Reed's four children and their respective wives. In addition, around a dozen Teamsters and camp assistants joined them, making a total of 32. Everything the group needed to make the journey was packed, including peace offerings of jewelry and cloth, should they encounter any hostile native Indians along the route. Within a month, the Donners and Reeds had reached Independence, Missouri. They were all healthy and in good spirits, and looked forward to joining the main wagon train heading west. After a brief stop, the group set off again, and over the next six weeks covered around 650 miles, reaching Fort Laramie, now southeastern Wyoming, in July 1846. At this point, the group divided. Most of the wagons went north towards Fort Hall using the tried and trusted Oregon Trail. But the Reeds, the Donners, and a number of others decided to take a shortcut and headed southwest toward Fort Bridger. This route had been recommended to them by an unreliable guide named Lansford Hastings. He had claimed that this route would shave more than 300 miles from the journey to California. In reality, Hastings' shortcut was 125 miles longer than the established trail and it would take the pioneers through some of the most inhospitable county in the entire Great Basin. James Reed had been warned not to take this route, but he didn't heed this advice, and a party of 87 people pressed on in a convoy of 23 ox-drawn wagons. George Donner was elected to serve as their leader. On July 31st, the Donner party entered Hastings Cutoff, which would take the group south of the Great Salt Lake in what is now Utah. During that first week, they made good progress. However, Hastings, who had promised to lead them along the trail, was now with a different company of wagons, and the inexperienced Reed had to act as a guide. By the time they reached the Great Salt Lake Desert on August 30th, they were already two weeks behind schedule. But Hastings had assured them that they would be able to cross the desert in just two days. But instead, the journey took five days, and the party lost dozens of cattle in the desert and several wagons had to be abandoned. By the time the Donner Party reached the Humboldt River, with the shortcut rejoined the main California Trail, it was late September. All the other migrants of 1846 had already completed their journeys to California, and for the Donner Party, it was now a race against time before the winter weather set in. The migrants were exhausted and tensions were running high. And on October 5th, an altercation between Reed and a teamster ended with Reed fatally stabbing the man. The horrified migrants called for Reed to be hanged, but instead they expelled him from the group 
leaving him just with a horse. Greed continued his journey west alone, while the rest of his family remained with the Donna party. As the party began their climb of the Sierra foothills, their food supply was running low, and several of their oxen were already dead or had wandered off. By this point, they had hidden or buried virtually all their possessions, except the barest essentials necessary for survival. On October 31st, the exhausted migrants approached what is now known as Donna Pass across the Sierra Nevada, and found their passage blocked by deepening snow. Most of the party decided to build makeshift shelters. But at this point, what do you do, bro? Like, at this point, you're starting to give up hope. You fighting the weather, you took this shortcut, it turned out to be the wrong way to go. Now everybody's tensions is flaring. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes you gotta, <laughs> I'd be like, man, I just wondering if I could have survived in those times. I probably could have, but I'm thankful to be born in the times that I am, but that's, that's a different type of lifestyle right there, bro. That is a different type different type of lifestyle near yeah, what is now known as donna lake the donners and reeds whose progress was delayed by a wagon accident made a similar camp a few miles further east on the trail near alder creek by now all the migrants were in dire trouble on november 20th 1846 patrick green whose family had joined the party in independence missouri began a diary which he continued to write until March 1st, 1847. Look at this timeline here. They were here, May 12th. Here, the 31st of May, July. Mind you, start May 12th started. July 4th, here. That's a whole, that's almost a month right there, bro. July 30th, here. Here. September 2nd, October. Now, you know what the weather's like in May. Then switch to October, what the weather is like. Like, just let that set in for a moment. His account would provide the only contemporary written record of the Donner Party's ordeal. On December 15th, 1846, the first recorded death at the lake camp occurred when Bayless Williams, an employee of the Reed family, died of malnutrition. His death was the first of many. In desperation, some of the migrants tried to branch off and walk to get help, but the conditions soon prevented this, and they returned to the camps even more malnourished than when they left. Things were so bad that the migrants were eating the ox hide that was providing their huts with warmth and shelter. Strips of the ox hide were boiled up to make a disgusting glue-like soup. Quarrels between the members were also rife, with some claiming rations that were being saved for the children. On the survival mode. At that point, it's survival mode. One person then died, also then right. died of malnutrition. It's, it's, you in survival mode now, man. Oh, they don't get to the point where they start eating each other. With some claiming rations that were being saved for the children. On December 16th, 1846, a party of 17 men, women, and older children decided to try and cross the mountains on improvised snowshoes. Two of the party turned back early on, but the rest powered on. During the following torturous weeks, the group experienced snow blindness and overwhelming hardships caused by the bitter cold. However, the snowshoes proved to be effective on the climb, and despite the deep snow and inadequate food, they struggled on. But soon they became lost and confused, and that's when one of them first suggested that someone should volunteer to die to feed the others. Initially, this idea was rejected. That's what I was afraid of that was coming. I had just said it. But as they went on, and some of the party died anyway, in desperation, they were forced to eat the corpses to survive. Allegedly, towards the end, they were deciding amongst themselves who would be the next to be eaten. Well, it's unclear if any murders actually took place. Finally, the group stumbled into a Native American settlement where they were given food and shelter, and after a few days, with the help of tribe members, one of the party reached a ranch in a small farming community at the edge of the Sacramento Valley. A relief party was organized to rescue the stranded settlers at the lake camps. 
James Reed had also made it out to the Sierra Nevada and had already arranged an unsuccessful search party to try and rescue his family. Back at the camps, many migrants were dying of cold and hunger and Jacob and George Donner were among them. After several rescue parties were sent out, some of the migrants made it back safely, but several deaths occurred on the way and because of illness and injuries, it was impossible to remove everyone at the same time. And by the time the rescuers arrived, many of the late camp members had already turned to cannibalism in order to survive. The last of the survivors did not leave the late camp until April 1847. Of the 87 migrants in the river camps, only 48 survived. All of the Reed and Breen family lived, but Jacob and George Donner and their wives all perished. Some of their children survived, but were left orphaned. In the aftermath of the tragedy, with rumors of cannibalism rife, many of the survivors disputed the accounts, although some did speak freely about what they had to do to survive. Aliza Donner, who was only three years old during my- Imagine telling that story to somebody. I, yeah. It got to the point where we had to decide who lives or dies in order for others to survive. Imagine telling that story. And, you, and, and we sit here and complain about minor things. Look what they were faced with. Look what they had to do. Put that into perspective in your life of what you're going through. I always try to tell people, man, or remind people, not tell people, remind people. It could be worse. You know, and you might not like that at the time because you you in the thick of it. But it could be worse. Think about it. Migration and was the youngest of the Donner children. Later published an account of the ordeal and wrote about the emotional scars caused by the rumors of cannibalism. Many years later in 2010, the remains from the campsite were examined again and researchers announced that they had been unable to find any human bones or other physical evidence of cannibalism. Although it was noted that only cooked bones would be preserved, and it's unlikely that the Donner Party members would have needed to cook human bones. Today the site of the makeshift cabins is a tourist attraction that receives thousands of visitors each year. The state of California justifies memorializing a site where cannibalism likely occurred stating the episode was an isolated and tragic incident of American history that has been transformed into a major folk epic. Mm. Wow. Wow. Bella Almore. Now this next one is a bit of a blast from the past, but it's a case we've never covered on Top 5s, so thought we would have a look, as there has been a recent twist in the story. Kunigunde Makamotsi was the daughter of a Russian-Polish father and German mother. She went by various aliases, including Bella Elmore and Cora Turner. Bella was a stage name, however the aspiring music hall artist had little or no talent, so rarely found work. In 1893, under the name of Cora Turner, she married a homeopath and medicine dispenser, Holly Harvey Crippen, in New Jersey City. Cora was Crippen's second wife. His first wife, Charlotte, had died of a stroke in 1892, and after her death, Crippen had moved to New York and left the care of his two-year-old son, Holly Otto, to his parents in California. In 1897, Crippen and Cora moved to London although his US medical qualifications were not sufficient to allow Crippen to practice as a doctor in the UK, so he found work as a distributor of patent medicines, while Cora continued to pursue her stage career. By all accounts, Cora was an overbearing woman who liked to socialize and had several affairs, but nevertheless, her husband tried to support her as much as he could, and eventually it cost him his job, as he was spending so much time trying to manage her career. In 1900, Crippen found work again as the manager of Jouette's Institution for the Deaf. By 1905, the Crippen's marriage was in trouble and they moved to 39 Hilldrop Crescent in Holloway, London, where they took in lodgers to supplement Crippen's meager income. Allegedly, Cora had an affair with one of these lodgers and in turn, Crippen started an affair with Ethel Lenov, a young typist who worked at Jouette's. For the next five years, the Crippens led separate lives and slept in separate beds. 
however Cora still liked to throw dinner parties for her showbiz friends, and on the evening of Monday, the 31st of January 1910, two close friends of Cora, Paul and Clara Martinetti, came around for a meal. The couple left at around 1am on Tuesday the 1st of February and all seemed well. That was the last time anyone saw Cora Crippen alive. Over the next few weeks, people began to ask where Cora was and Crippen told a variety of stories about her whereabouts, but eventually said she had returned to America and died. Meanwhile, his lover moved into Hilldrop Crescent and began openly wearing Cora's clothes and jewelry. Cora's friends grew suspicious, and eventually one of them called the police. And on the yeah, that's suspicious alone. You know what I mean? Different, multiple stories of accounts of where she's at. Then you finally just said she moved back to America and died. Then you moved your lover in and started allowing her to wear her stuff. Does that seem logical? No, it don't. It don't. All things starting to point to you, homeboy. The 8th of July 1910, Chief Inspector Walter Drew knocked on the door of Hilldrop Crescent, where he found Ethel alone. Ethel told Drew he would find Crippen at work, so the inspector visited Crippen at his office and the two returned together to Hilldrop Crescent, where Crippen happily showed the officer around the house. He also told Drew a different story about Cora's whereabouts, saying she had left him for another man. Chief Inspector Dew seems happy with this. So she's not, she didn't die in America. Now she left the medical. Left you for another man. Like, it's only a matter of time now, bro. Explanation, and after a quick search of the house, left and asked Crippen to get his wife to contact him to confirm the story. However, Crippen and Ethel panicked and fled to Brussels, where they spent the night at a hotel before boarding the Canadian Pacific liner, SS Montrose, at Antwerp bound for Canada. The pair's sudden departure prompted police to search the house in Hildor Crescent again, Super. and during the fourth and final search, they found the torso of a human body buried under the brick floor of the basement. An autopsy confirmed traces of the calming drug, scopolamine, in the body parts, and the remains were identified by a scar on a piece of skin from the abdomen that matched with the medical procedure Cora had had although her head, limbs, and skeleton were never recovered. Meanwhile, Crippen, who had shaved off his mustache and Ethel disguised as a boy, were crossing the Atlantic on Montrose, although passengers had noticed they looked overly affectionate for a father and son. A call had already been put out to ships about the two fugitives, and Captain Henry George Kendall recognized the pair. Just before steaming beyond the range of his shipboard transmitter, he sent a wireless telegram to the British authorities. Crippen would be the first criminal to be captured with the aid of wireless telegraphy. On receiving the message, Inspector Du boarded a faster White Star liner, SS Laurentic, from Liverpool, and arrived in Quebec, Canada, ahead of Crippen. Du then boarded the Montrose disguised as a pilot, and Crippen was invited to meet the pilots as they came aboard. Du removed his pilot's cap and said, Good morning, Dr. Crippen. Do you know me? I'm Chief Inspector Dew from Scotland Yard. After a pause, Crippen replied, Thank God it's over. The suspense has been too great. I couldn't stand it any longer. He then held out his wrists for the handcuffs. Crippen and Ethel were returned to Britain where they stood trial at the Old Bailey. Although none of the evidence presented seemed conclusive, but despite this, the jury found Crippen guilty of murder after just 27 minutes and he was sentenced to death. Ethel was charged only with being an accessory after the fact and acquitted. Throughout the proceedings and at his sentencing, Crippen showed no remorse for his wife, only concern for his lover's reputation. On Wednesday, the 23rd of November, 1910, 48-year-old Crippen was hanged at Pentonville, London. His last request was for a photograph of Ethel and some of her letters to be buried with him in his unmarked grave, a request that was granted. Over the years, questions have arisen about the investigation, trial, and evidence that convicted Crippen. And in October 2007, Michigan State University forensic scientist David Foran claimed that mitochondrial DNA evidence showed the remains found beneath Crippen's cellar floor were not those of Cora Crippen, and that the flesh samples found at the scene were that of a male. 
However, the new scientific evidence for Crippen's innocence has been disputed because the technique used was very new and done only by one team on a degraded sample. In December 2009, the UK's Criminal Cases Review Commission, having reviewed the case, declared that the Courts of Appeal will not hear the case to pardon Crippen posthumously. Crippen's name has lived on, and between 1910 until 2016, a waxwork of Dr. Crippen was on display in the Chamber of Horrors at Madame Tussauds in London. But in a curious twist, during the Doggo Bank earthquake of 1931, the strongest earthquake ever recorded in the UK, the head of Crippen's waxwork fell off and rolled along the floor. In what many Ain't that ironic? Ain't that ironic? Cause how was she found? Missing head and limbs? Oh, okay. Okay. Many believed was a message from the grave. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt the investigation into Kara's disappearance was less than perfect. So could they have hung an innocent man? What do you think? I think he did it. That's all I'm gonna say. The boy from Soma Sierra. This next case is well known in Spain where it happened, but is less well known to the rest of the world. It's the mystery of what happened to the boy from Soma Sierra, a case dubbed Europe's strangest disappearance. Andreas Martinez was a truck driver who lived in the south of Spain, in Fuente Alamo, Murcia. On some of his trips, he took along his wife, Carmen Gomez and their 10 year old son, Juan Pedro. On June 24th, 1986, Andreas was due to transport 20,000 liters of sulfuric acid up north to the Spanish city of Bilboa. Because Juan had done well in school, Andreas invited Juan and Carmen along for the journey. The family left around 7 p.m. after picking up the truck in the city of Cartagena and by 6 a.m. the following day, the truck had entered Soma Sierra, a mountain pass to the north of Madrid. At this point, witnesses described the truck as being driven erratically and at speeds, as if it had a mechanical problem. Soon after, the truck broke off another driver's car wing mirror, and then it bumped into another car from behind, causing it to crash head-on with the truck that was travelling in the opposite direction. The impact caused Andreas's truck to overturn, spilling the sulfuric acid out onto the side of the road and covering the area with a toxic cloud. The authorities had to act quickly to neutralize the acid before it leaked into a nearby river. After the area had been cleaned up, sadly they found Andreas and Carmen's body in the crashed truck. However, Juan was nowhere to be seen. Although initially they weren't looking for him, as it wasn't until they spoke to relatives that they realized the boy was traveling with his parents. Investigators later re-examined the truck and surrounding area, but found no signs of Juan Pedro. Thoughts turned to the possibility that the sulfuric acid had melted his body, although chemists later dismissed the idea, as he would have had at least left behind some hair, teeth or nails at the scene. Witnesses soon came forward and said the last time the family was seen was at a bar at around 5.30 a.m. on the morning of the crash, where there didn't appear to be anything untoward about their demeanor. After examining the truck, investigators discovered that there was nothing wrong with Andreas's truck, so there was no mechanical reason for him to be driving the way he was. However, his tachometer recorded that Andreas had stopped his truck 12 times as he went up the mountain during a period of 20 minutes, which does seem strange. To this day, nothing has been found of 10-year-old Juan, despite extensive investigations. So what happened to him? While there have been many theories, the most popular is that Juan was kidnapped and his father was pursuing his abductors when he crashed. This is kind of backed up by the driver of the car, who Andreas hit, who told police he was assisted by a man and blonde-haired woman in a white van. The woman was allegedly a nurse and looked over the man's injuries before driving away. The same couple were also allegedly seen pulling up to Andreas's truck after the collision and took something out of the cab, possibly a package or even Juan. This does seem a little far-fetched, but not beyond the realms of possibility. Others have suggested drugs were involved, although the family have strenuously denied this. Another theory speculates that Juan Pedro might have survived the crash and climbed out of the truck and while looking for help stumbled upon the white van couple who then abducted him or that he was burned by the acid and stumbled out of the cab 
tried to make his way to the river to soothe his skin. Although considering the massive search for Juan Pedro after it was discovered that he was missing, it seems likely that he would have been found had he wandered around the area and collapsed or died somewhere. Right. But Juan Pedro's family are hanging on to the belief that he is still alive. It's been reported that in May 1987, a man in Madrid met a blind old woman and a boy who looked like Juan Pedro. The woman was an Iranian refugee looking for the American embassy. She said that she and her family had been in Spain for only six months. Yet the boy she was with spoke fluent Spanish with an Andalusian accent just like Juan. When the man complimented the boy's strong Spanish, the old woman got nervous and wouldn't explain how he knew the language so well. Today, Juan Pedro would be 45 years old, and if he is still alive, how amazing would it be if he made contact? I think he was kidnapped. Just, just my guess. You know what I mean? I think he was kidnapped. Like I said, it fits the 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 events leading up to the crash, him stopping so many times, and him running into the back of something. And then him not being there. I agree with the chemist. There will be something to prove that he was, you know what I mean? He, he, the acid had gotten to him and maybe, you know what I mean, melted his body or whatever. But I'm thinking he wasn't, he was taken. He was taken. That's, that's my opinion. That's my guess. That's crazy though. Sheesh. The Pottery Cottage Murders. When someone is convicted of a violent crime, we trust the system to keep that person safely incarcerated. Don't say we. So I have a hard time trusting the system, bro. And we watch a lot of these videos to, to all be, you know what I mean? Just hesitant about trusting this system. I know I am. I have my reservations about it. For the duration of their sentence until they are deemed fit to be released back into society. Sadly, in our next story, that was not the case, and the consequences were horrific. On the night of the 21st of August 1976, William Thomas Hughes followed a young couple he had met in a nightclub to a park where he beat the man with a brick and raped his partner. Hughes was quickly arrested after a tip-off from a member of the public and was remanded to Leicester Prison. However, despite a criminal past of violent behaviour, Hughes was allocated work in the prison kitchen, and on the 3rd of December 1976, he stole a boning knife that he managed to conceal from prison authorities, despite regular searches. It later transpired that limited information about how violent Hughes could be was not passed on to Leicester Prison, and because of his demeanour and good behaviour, they designated him as a low-risk Category B inmate. They didn't receive the full report of how dangerous he was until after he escaped. On the 12th of January 1977, Hughes was scheduled to appear at court in Chesterfield, and he was transported to the court in the back of a taxi, handcuffed to prison officer Ken Simmons. Fellow officer Don Sprittle was sat in the front next to the driver. So instead of Hughes having both hands cuffed, he had one hand free. The weather conditions during the 55 mile journey were horrendous. There had been heavy snowfall and the traffic was disrupted. As they neared the end of their journey, Hughes insisted he needed to stop for a bathroom break. This was when he retrieved the stolen boning knife he had hidden on his person. And when he returned to the taxi, he stabbed Sprintle in the back of the neck before turning the knife on Simmons. After incapacitating both, he dumped the driver and the badly injured officers at the roadside. Hughes then drove the taxi off at speed, crashing into a wall along a road close to Beely Moor in the Derbyshire Peak District of Central and Northern England. Police were soon notified of Hughes' escape and an immediate search was ordered. However, initially they searched the wrong area, believing that Hughes wouldn't attempt to cross the exposed moorland in such bad weather, but they were wrong. Hughes had made his way across the moor and stopped at a remote farmhouse called Pottery Cottage. Hughes entered the home from the back door armed with two axes he had stolen from the garden shed. The only people home were Arthur and Amy Minton, who shared the cottage with their youngest daughter Gillian, her husband Richard Moran and their adopted 10-year-old daughter Sarah. Hughes told Arthur and Amy that he was on the run from the police and needed to lay low until dusk. He promised them he wouldn't hurt them. Soon after, Gillian and Sarah arrived home, followed some- Please tell me they didn't believe that. 
I'm on the run from the police. I just need somewhere to lay low. I will not hurt you. Please tell me they didn't go for that. That's just asking to kill, get killed. Oh, hey, here. We got tons of knives in there. We'll be sleeping. You can kill us later. Promised them he wouldn't hurt them. Soon after, Gillian and Sarah arrived home, followed sometimes later by Richard, who found Hughes holding a knife to his wife's throat, threatening to kill her if anyone approached him. He forced Richard to the floor and bound his hands and legs. He then tied up Gillian and Amy, followed by Arthur and Sarah, who were in the annex. But Arthur strongly resisted and was brutally manhandled, dragged across the floor and tied to an armchair. Hughes then gagged all the adults and isolated them in separate rooms, taking Sarah through to the annex. Gillian, who was bound and gagged in her bedroom, heard the sounds of a commotion coming from the lounge below and realized it was her father being beaten. After the beating, Hughes casually made tea for his hostages and later sexually assaulted Gillian. The next morning, a local authority truck arrived to empty the septic tank. Hughes ordered Gillian outside to greet them, warning her to act normal. As she walked through the house, she caught a glimpse of her father, who appeared motionless in the armchair. Hughes dragged her away, telling her that he was asleep. Gillian also asked about her daughter's whereabouts, and Hughes assured her that she was asleep in the annex. After getting the family to call in sick to work and school, Hughes sent Gillian out alone to buy newspapers and cigarettes and check for roadblocks, warning her not to do anything stupid. Terrified of what he might do to her family, Gillian carried out his instructions. When Gillian returned, she noticed that her father had been moved. Hughes claimed that he was now in his bedroom. Throughout that day, Gillian made food for the family and Hughes took it to them. He even took some soft toys into Sarah, claiming that she was really pleased to see them. Hughes reassured his hostages that he would be leaving that evening, and he untied Gillian, Richard and Amy, and they all drank whiskey together and played card games. Hughes prepared for his escape by- Wait, wait, what? You gagged us, beat us, you raped her. And now you want to untie us to play card games? I'm not that person, bro. First shot I get, and I'm going to make it count. And it's gonna be calculated. But I'm taking my chance, I'm taking my shot. By sending Gillian and Richard out for supplies. During the journey, Richard tried to convince his wife that they should go to the police. Yes. But fearing for the life of her daughter and parents, she refused. That night- I can understand that too. The weather conditions were so treacherous that Hughes decided to stay for a second night. The next evening, Hughes parted Pottery Cottage, leaving all his hostages tied up. But he decided to take Gillian with him. However, after driving several miles, he insisted they turn around and go back to the house, claiming he had forgotten a map. Hughes went back into the house alone and was gone for a considerable time. And when he returned, the car wouldn't start, so he sent Gillian unaccompanied to a neighbor's house to ask for a tow. There, she finally alerted them to the hostage situation, but they didn't have a phone, so they had to travel to get help. As Gillian walked back to the car, she could see her mother staggering in the snow before collapsing. Hughes then forced Gillian to approach another neighbor for help. This time he went with her, and soon they were on their way. By now, the first neighbor had alerted the police, and they had arrived at Pottery Cottage. There they found a scene of utter horror. Amy Minton lay dead in the snow, and inside the house they found the bodies of Richard, Sarah and Arthur. All four had multiple stab wounds to the throat and chest. Cruelly, Hughes had kept up the pretense that Arthur and Sarah were still alive throughout, even pretending to speak with them. That's why I say I would have took my shot, bro. You're, you're ultimately trusting a criminal, a known killer. When in reality, it was clear they had both been murdered on the first night. The police soon caught up with Hughes and Gillian, and a high-speed chase ensued across Derbyshire and into Cheshire ending when Hughes crashed into a wall in the village of Reno. As police tried to negotiate, Hughes held an axe over Gillian's head and demanded a vehicle in which to escape. To try and save Gillian's life, a car was provided. But when Hughes went to strike Gillian with the axe, police marksmen opened a fire and shot Hughes dead. It was the first time an officer from Derbyshire Constabulary had shot anyone dead, and the first time British police had shot dead an escaped prisoner. Gillian was the only survivor. So that's it for this video. And remember, if you haven't already heard... 
55 hours with the knife, man. First time they had shot and killed, and I, it's no better time than the present for them. And he was the right person for them to shoot. Like, I know it's tough to think about stuff like that, man. But you got to think about, I know you're thinking about your family. You're thinking about everything in those type of situations, bro. So that's a tough decision to make. I know we could sit back and I can sit back and from my chair right here, say what I would have done or what I wouldn't have done. You know, but ultimately it's until you're in those type of situations that, you know, and can you blame her? She was worried about her, ch her child and, and the rest of her family. So she thought what she was doing was right. So you can't knock her for that. And you can't knock somebody for saying first opportunity I got, I'm taking my chances because he's going to kill us. Is Neither one of them are wrong in my opinion because I understand what you're doing it for. So, bro, these stories here, though. This is one for the books. Yeah, I'll get at me in the comment section. Let me know what y'all think, man. This was a rough one tonight. Some next reaction, I'm out. Y'all stay solid. Go on.